Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. This is Rocket Science, and in this lesson, we will re-examine the helium leak problem on Starliner, looking at how these pressure vessels are made, how they are used, and what can happen when one fails, discussing contained failures, uncontained failures, and catastrophic failures. And we look forward to your opinions on these questions. Many of you agreed with our assessment of the Starliner spacecraft, but a few of you didn't pointing out that Boeing has done great things in the past. Our question would be, what does it hurt to be safe? And what's the worst that could happen? Copy. Well, I, I think at this point, because the, uh, the hypobaric exposure is, is the big problem, and given his exam, I am concerned that there are some severe DCS hits. And so I would, uh, I, I would recommend trying to get him in the suit as soon as possible and giving oxygen as, as best as able during that process. But the, the best thing would be to get him in the suit at ASAP. Is there a way that the mask can be attached? So is there a way that we could get the suit over the head, have the visor open, and put the mask at least close to his face while you finish sealing up the suit? Or is that not feasible? Copy. Um, understand that this is a best effort treatment, and so whatever you can do is going to be better than doing nothing. Um, and just as an FYI, prior to sealing, um, closing the visor and pressurizing the suit, I would like you to check uh, his pulse uh, one more time. How copy. The audio you just listened to was accidentally broadcast from the International Space Station on the 12th of June, 2024, just a few days ago as I record this. This was a simulated astronaut emergency, and NASA runs drills like this all the time, though usually they are not broadcast, as they could be confused with a real emergency. So the release is probably just a coincidence, though if something goes wrong with Starliner, it will clearly be seen as foreshadowing. Why am I so worried about Starliner? It's just a small helium leak after all. Well, at first it was just one small helium leak, and it was deemed safe to launch the ship. Now it's five, and that raises the question. Were there already five earlier, and they just didn't find them? Leading us to the inescapable conclusion that they are either incompetent, or perhaps just unable to know? Because if they found the five and told us it was one to go through with the launch, that's a big deal. If, on the other hand, they correctly identified a single leak on the ground, but the vibration and acoustic environment of launch created four more leaks, that tells us that this spacecraft is not ready to fly. What about the other three propulsion units in each doghouse on Starliner? Were these all checked for leaks before launch? And if they didn't leak before, are they going to start leaking now? due to the same stresses that caused the other leaks on the first one? Why should we assume not? The Starliner spacecraft is made by brilliant engineers, with an internal pressure vessel to protect the crew, and anything that might be dangerous attached outside of that, just like the Apollo capsules. Dangerous things would include high-voltage wiring, propulsion systems, and pressurized tanks. And then there's an aeroshell over all of it. But in all of these systems, there is no tank holding more pressure than the helium tanks. These are usually composite overwrapped titanium pressure vessels today. They can also be made of aluminum or even magnesium alloy. One of these from an early Soviet rocket survived re-entry somehow and made lots of people think it was a UFO. I thought it was unlikely that our interstellar visitors would throw empty metal spheres at us. But who knows about the traditions of aliens? Maybe that's a standard greeting for them. In any case, helium pressure vessels have been used since the dawn of spaceflight. There are several reasons for this. One is that helium is inert, so it won't corrode metals. Hydrogen is a smaller and lighter molecule, but extremely combustible and famous for making metals brittle. Helium is low density, being the lightest gas possible next to hydrogen, so it doesn't add a lot of mass. There are many ways to measure pressure, pounds per square inch or PSI, bars, which are 100,000 pascals each, atmospheres, which are just a little more than a bar, about 101,325 pascals. 
But for this exercise, I'll use pascals and psi to make my imperial friends happy. A good estimate of the pressure in the tanks used to pressurize spacecraft systems today is about 3,000 psi, which would be 20.7 megapascals or 207 bar. The molar mass of hydrogen is 2.016 grams per mole, while that of helium is twice as heavy as we'd expect at 4.0026 grams per mole. If we use the ideal gas law, seeing that N equals PV over RT, where N is the number of moles, P is the pressure, V is the volume, R is the ideal gas constant, we'll use a temperature of 298 Kelvin, which is 25 Celsius and 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and putting these into our equation and using one cubic meter of volume, we get 8,347 moles. This turns out to be the same for all of the gases we look at, because gas molecules can be considered point-like, which means their sizes, relative to the space between the gas particles, is negligible. So knowing the moles of any gas we can put in a cubic meter volume at this pressure and temperature allows us to use molar mass to calculate total mass for each of these individual gases. This comes out to be 16.8 kilograms for hydrogen and 33.4 kilograms for helium. So considering hydrogen problems, helium is the best choice. Early rocket designers like Robert Goddard and Hermann Oberth did not use helium in their pressurized rockets. That's because even though helium was discovered in 1868 on the sun, it wasn't commercially available on Earth until about 1915 and was extremely expensive. Helium is created by fusion on the sun, but is only found in pockets underneath the ground on Earth, as a natural result of the radioactive decay of elements like uranium. Goddard and Oberth used just plain air or nitrogen to pressurize their tanks. And the V-2 rocket, built by Oberth's protege and the future father of the Saturn V rocket system, Werner von Braun. The V-2 was the first rocket to ever go into space, and von Braun used pressure vessels to pressurize its propellant tanks, which held ethanol and liquid oxygen. This was not a pressure-fed rocket engine, as it also had a hydrogen peroxide-powered turbopump. However, it is still necessary to maintain high pressure in the propellant tanks, even in turbopump-fed systems, so that we don't get vapor lock and we can move the propellants fast enough. Starship uses nitrogen today for some of its thrusters, though they are moving toward vented hot gas for most of them to increase efficiency. If we do the math on nitrogen, we see that it has a mass of about 234 kilograms per cubic meter at the stated pressure and temperature. That extra mass works fine for experiments on Earth, but every kilogram that we send to space has an enormous cost and reduces the payload that we can put up. For those reasons, helium is the best all around and it is used almost exclusively in space. A quick note. A cubic meter would be a cube of three and one-third feet per side. Here we see the Apollo Saturn V S2 second stage. These spheres are for helium to keep the liquid oxygen and hydrogen tanks pressurized. And they have a volume of about 1.75 cubic meters or 62 cubic feet each. Helium pressure vessels have been used ever since for this purpose. Here's one in a Falcon 9. NASA categorizes pressure vessel failures into two types, burst and leak before burst. And I'll include a link to a paper in the description. Some of the significant failure modes for COPVs are both liner and composite related. So the liner failure modes that we've actually had failures occur during flight and also during qualification have been things that are associated with fracture control. So those can be things like, um, cr you know, sustained load crack growth, stress corrosion cracking, um, cyclic fatigue type crack growth, um, incompatibility with the fluid that's being stored within the COPV, um, buckling of the liner. For the composite, there's other failure modes. Um, those can be, in some ways, more insidious because uh, it is 
sometimes you don't get notice and they're very difficult to model. So for example, those could be impact damage that's non-visible. It could be um, stress rupture failure mode, which can occur regardless of the type of overwrap you're particularly using in your composite. Um, and those are, those are particularly significant for, um, for COPVs. So, for example, um, for the shuttle, when, uh, when they were doing development and qualification of COPVs that were specifically going to go on the shuttle, um, they had nine failures that were both for metallic pressure vessels and also for COPVs. Uh, those were related, and so that's why I mentioned the all, the all metal version. Uh, those COPVs failed from a lot of things that um, we, we deal with now using fracture control. So um, stress corrosion cracking, weld pores, weld defects, weld cracks, uh, also um, cyclic fatigue. A lot of these things occurred because the titanium, the Ti-64 that we were using at that time uh, was kind of new, real, relatively speaking, and so um, we weren't terribly confident in our ability to weld. Um, since then, there's been a lot of advances, but at the time, these failures were occurring because we weren't um, the technology was still a little bit immature at that time. In addition to the failures that occurred for shuttle um, during, the, um, during the development phase, uh, since that time we've done a lot more looking into COPVs in general and understanding how they fail. Um, one of the failure modes that has become important is stress rupture life. And that is, stress rupture is the sudden failure of a COPV at typical operating pressures. Um, and we know that this occurs and we can make this failure mode occur in the laboratory. Fortunately, it has not occurred on any flight project, but it, it could. And we need to understand the bounds at which um, it becomes important. Um, that failure mode is, um, we, we know that it exists from test, but we, we aren't aware that it's, you know, we haven't seen any failures due to that in service. Now let's look at what can happen when a helium pressure vessel fails. This is a SpaceX Falcon 9 on September 1, 2016 at Cape Canaveral, getting ready to carry the Amos 6 communications satellite into orbit. Inside these tanks are helium pressure vessels, seen here. Before the shuttle program, these were just metal, like the ones we saw on the Saturn V second stage. But now, they are usually composite overwrapped pressure vessels, which are lighter and stronger than the originals. These were first developed for the shuttle's orbital maneuvering and main propulsion systems. And this is a perfect example of how research and development of one spacecraft can benefit all that come after. In this case, there was a small dent in one of the helium pressure vessels in the oxygen tank. As the helium was loaded in and the pressure increased, the dent popped out, creating a burst of heat in a pure oxygen environment which caused the composite material to burn and produced a small explosion on the side of the COPV. This caused it to rupture and release all that high pressure helium, which caused the tank to explode from being overpressurized. Rocketdyne will not have put the helium tanks inside the hypergolic propellant tanks for Starliner. There would be no reason to, and hypergolics would not react well to the carbon overwrap. So, as we explained last time, we have a separate helium leak coming from this manifold that is distributing pressurized helium to the Starliner's propellant tanks for the orbital maneuvering and RCS systems. The leaks have been at the manifold and the valve from the tank to the manifold has been shut off. But there are more leaks now than there were before. Now we have five. We already had combustion chamber pressurization failures in the Starliner that disabled five rocket engines on the way to the ISS. Four were able to be reset, but that means that the fifth was not. The worst possible scenario would be for a helium pressure vessel, manifold, or supply line to rupture, damaging one of the hypergolic tanks, while the Starliner was attached to the ISS. That would destroy the Starliner, 
Here is what can happen when something goes wrong with these systems. That was a Dragon capsule. A similar explosion would completely destroy Starliner, blasting it away from the station and tearing a hole in the airlock. That's why I think the Starliner should be detached and allowed to drift away from the ISS now. If the ship is repressurized while still attached, and the crew is able to board and move safely away from the ISS, that doesn't mean NASA made the right choice. This ship is developing more leaks every time the systems are pressurized. What will happen as it uses its engines to lower its orbit or move itself away from the station? The engine's firing shakes the ship and puts stress on every seal and valve. What if a bigger leak develops, overpressurizing the sealed space between the service module and the doghouse, blasting a hole in the Starliner's heat shield? If the ship makes it to service module capsule separation and gets far enough away, they should be safe for re-entry. But I don't think they should take those unnecessary chances. I think they should ditch the Starliner now and not risk another American spaceflight catastrophe. While America definitely won the race to the moon, we were also first in the number of astronauts killed in service. We lost three with Apollo 1 as they burned up in a training exercise on Earth, and the Soviets lost Ilushkin on the first crewed Vostok spaceflight test, and another three Soviet astronauts during a re-entry depressurization event. But then we went on to lose the entire crews of both shuttles Challenger and Columbia. That's why I say undock the Starliner, let it drift away from the ISS, and then return it autonomously to Earth, keeping our astronauts safe on the ISS. We can send up SpaceX suits for them with the Dragon capsule. There's no rush, and there's no reason to risk the lives of more American astronauts. At least that's what I think. Let us know what you think, and stay safe at Astroproterium.